Hey guys, so today we're talking about something that all of us struggle to understand because it's drainage. It's something that doesn't meet the eye. It's something that's always hidden from us. We don't really see it, but it's always there. So the engineers do this work. It kind of is hidden away from everyone and it saves a lot of people actually their lives at the end of the day. But we won't go into that too much. We'll more just talk about drainage itself. Okay, so what we'll learn today is the importance of drainage systems the identif to identify drainage system components, then the testing methods, the, di the discussion of the design process, and the importance of applying good drainage. So the term drainage has a variety of interpretation within civil engineering itself. You will get a lot of uh, interpretation as well. Civil engineers themselves talk about we we'll talk about drainage as in roads, as in surface water or underground pipes where water mains, sewers and storm water come in. But then housing contractors, which you can be as well as a civil engineer, uh, talk about it as internal and e external pipes of your house. So that's just that. And then you can also go further and be a geotechnical engineer, which talks about subsurface water and that effect on soil conditions and the actual water within the soil is drainage. So it is a difficult one to talk about, but let's try and break it down a little bit more. The arrangement of any drain, drainage scheme is, is governed by internal layout of connection, external pipe positions, the relationship of one building to another, the location of public pipes, and then the topography of the area. Obviously, if you have a flat area, it's gonna be different to when it is a hilly area. Sometimes the hilly area is actually better for the drainage. Okay, so definitions that's gonna be important here are these ones, there's more in your book as well. Water table, conduits, potable water, which is basically drinkable water. Uh, the difference between sewage, sewers and sewerage that's an important one to know, the difference between hydro hydrological studies and hydraulic stu studies, and then your catchment area. Drainage materials, they are either rigid or flexible materials. Uh, clay is often used in domestic work. Cast iron is an alternative method, and then flexible drain pipes are usually made of pitch fiber, or PVC. So let's talk first about the vitrified clay pipes. So as the name suggests, it is made of clay and they are baked in ovens. They are very popular in drainage, but they are no longer used. So when pipes are rebuilt or when something goes wrong, they are automatically replaced these clay pipes with something else. There are two standards that are at play, those two there and in the codes of practice, are also important. It's not something you need to learn. Uh, it's just something I wanted to highlight to you. Consider the following points when specifying clay pipes. The pipes should comply with the standards, those standards that I said now that you don't need to study. Uh, they're specified with flexible mechanical joints. Rubber rings must comply with their own standards. They always refer to the code of practice and if they are used for chemical effluent, additional precautions may be necessary. Then we talk about joints. So some of these, we're gonna talk about the other types as well, but some of the stuff we're talking about now is more specific to clay pipes, but some of the stuff we're talking about is more specific or more broadly specified to all of the types. So joints are, was, or it used to be a caulking material initially but it has been discontinued because of a couple of issues. In your book, you can find more issues of it. The four types that are currently in use is rolling rubber rings, elastomer, spigo, and sockets. Then you get sleeve and elastomer spigo, and then you also get plain ended pipes with a jointing sleeve and a, ga and a gasket. So then we talk about drains or drainage in general again. When designing some drainage systems, you have to ensure that the gradient for the drainage pipes are laid to a maximum of one in six and a minimum of one in 60. I hope you remember what that does mean. 
the one refers to your vertical distance, your six or your 60 refers to your horizontal distance. So in South Africa, we will talk about a one in six and we will talk about meters. So one meter up equals six meters to the side. You have to remember that. Uh, the next activity will also help you a little bit with that uh, to understand it. The minimum cover that you also need to ensure with drainage systems are 800 millimeters. If you need a shallower one, the pipe has to be encased. All drains must be accessible and then it should also be flexible to avoid cracking and joining. So this activity is something that is important for you to go through. It is a very easy. It looks more difficult than it actually is. Uh, there's two options to actually approach it. I prefer option two when approaching this. Also something you have to understand is this IL is higher here than it is over here. That's all you need to understand. And then further than that, you can actually go on and do this yourself. Very easy examples. Okay, going further into the parts of a drain, you get anchor blocks. They prevent the pipes from moving. There's a whole, whole section of it in the book. Then you get sewerage and manholes. Manholes are generally located where the pipe changes in direction or gradient. Uh, at junctions, the head of each sewer and then intervals not exceeding 100 meter for straight runs. You can maybe read up a little bit more on why uh, manholes are where directions change and gradients do change. Okay, then we talk about installing pipes. Contractors may use the best and strongest pipes available, but if they are not installed properly, the drainage system will fail. And it is important that the ground conditions are carefully checked. When installing pipes, backfilling should to follow as soon as possible after excavation. So it should always be done just after the excavation. Ensure correct earth cover when backfilling. Adhere to trench widths as specified on the drawing. Ensure the correct pipe bedding. Shoring of the excavated sides. Keep the excavated soil away from the sides. Ensure the correct alignment grades of pipe when installing and then use granular material to level out the trench floor and handle pipes carefully. Okay, so types of bedding designs in South Africa. In the book, it goes very deep into it. I don't want you to know too much of it, just if you can read up a little bit more of it and just understand that there are different bedding types. Okay, so then we talk about backfilling again. So that is actually pouring the soil back when you are done with laying your pipe. It should usually be placed in layers and compacted by hand for the full width of the trench. That's just to protect your pipe at the end of the day. The main filling can be placed and mechanically compacted once the initial backfill has reached the level approximately 300 millimeters above the pipe. That is when you can't really break the pipe anymore. Okay, so the second type of pipe we're gonna talk about is cast iron pipe. Those pipes are generally only considered for domestic drainage. They are made with a spigo and socket with rigid or flexible joints. They are given a protective coating of hot tar. You can read up, is it still hot tar or what is it used to today? And then it is not popular because they are expensive. You can rather use PVC, it is cheaper. Then you get pitch fiber pipes. They are made from preformed felted wood cellulose fiber you won't think wood and and water mix as well but they are then thoroughly impregnated with cold tar or bitumous compounds that actually do protect the wood from getting into the water but if you do google pitch fiber pipes i challenge you to get a pipe that is actually still correct and not broken in pieces it is suitable for all forms of domestic drainages and it is laid to lower gradients because of a smooth bore and it, the flow capacity is just more in it. Then you talk about UPVC pipes or the more commonly known PVC pipe. It is sound and durable. It has a smooth bore 
are light and easy to handle. It comes in long lengths, reducing the number of joints required, and they can be jointed and laid in all weathers. Concrete pipes are made of a fixture of fine aggregates or mixture, not fixture, mixture of fine aggregates and portlet cement, which is then poured over a wire mesh. They are non-pressure pipes, usually, but you can get them in pressure pipes as well. The example that is shown over there, you can just do that example as well. Again, a very easy example. Then we talk about the properties of concrete pipes. Due to the concrete density, concrete pipes are relatively strong. They are good corrosion resistance properties and they have two classes, which are pressure and non-pressure situations. Like I said, they can do both. So pipe loads uh, are subjected to, or pipes are subjected to forces, which are basically primary and secondary loads. You can read up a little bit more on the two. Uh, primary loads are stuff like it can be calculated, it's easy to calculate, it is mass of earth above the full, it is traffic loads, internal pressure and loading, mass of the pipe, mass of the water. Then the secondary loads are more of the difficult things to calculate or, or think of before the time. They are the change in clay volume, pressure due to growth of roots, settlement of foundation, thermal and moisture changes, and then restraint caused by the, main, the manhole. Surface drainage, you will find some form of rainwater channeling on all building structures. There's a little bit more on this on those two pages that you can read. The pipes used for domestic rainwater installations are made of asbestos, probably not anymore, it is not a recommended product, and then your UPVC. The advantages of the UPVC include easier jointing and no gutter bolts are required, joint is self-sealing, there is no corrosion with it because it's basically a plastic, but then it is, the decoration is usually not required, breakages are reduced and better flow properties in, enable smaller sections and gentler falls. Okay, so this is a type of picture that I might give you and then you have to describe what the pieces are there, you get your runoff at the top, from your house, you get an inlet at the street level. Then you get your storm water that goes under through the, through the road. Into a river, which is your outlet, or not necessarily a river in Bloemfontein, actually close to CUT, there's a big channel. That's what this more or less is, the water body. Then you get your, we talk further about surface drainage, and it is comprised of two aspects, which is your hydro, hydrological study, which is basically the study of the volume of water that will be in your catchment area, and then your hydraulic study, which is basically the forces that your pipe will handle. Pipe and gutter sizing. The size of the gutter and downpipes to effectively cater for discharge from a roof will depend on the area of the roof, the intensity of the rainfall, the material you use, the fall within the gutter and the number, size and position of the outlooks. There are a couple of tests you also, also should do on pipes. This is to see if there's leaks or if the flow is right, if the, the gradient is right. There's a water test, a smoke test, an air test, and then a visual inspection. If you do get your first job one day as a site agent, your job would probably be something along these lines. So you might want to watch a video or read up a little bit more on these four. Then we talk about pipe connections. All sewer connections are made so that the incoming drains or private sewers, so basically the sewers coming from your house, join to the main sewer uh, obliquely in the direction of the flow. So it shouldn't go against the flow, it should join with the flow. And there's actually a correct angle for that as well. The method of connection will depend on several factors. The relative sizes of the, the sewers connecting to each other, the invert level, so basically how deep your two manholes are, the position of the nearest inspection chambers, the sewer is existing or is it being laid because if it's being laid you can change a couple of things in your design, the type of joints or junctions and then the shortest and most a practicable route. 
Then we talk about channels. So that's where I was talking about that uh, water channel that you will find going through the middle, middle of Bloemfontein, a massive one. Channels are conduits typically used to alter the flow path of existing water. You get smaller channels, of course, as well. That's just a very big channel. You get very small channels as well. So open drainage channels, the advantages of them, they are low construction cost, large discharge, and storage capacities and multiple uses. The disadvantages, though, is the space that they occupy, the degree of maintenance, and the possible abuse. So that space that it occupies, obviously think of it if you have, uh, if you have stormwater drains running under your road, as we have in most areas in Bloemfontein, compared to open channels in a lot of rural areas, you, the road is wider there, so it wastes space. So in an urban area like Bloemfontein, you don't want these open drains, you want a closed drain that's under the road. It's also unsafe, these open drains, but that's not mentioned in here, but it is unsafe as well. Then you get a culvert, which is basically the opposite of an open drain. It's basically the stuff that goes under the road. So a culvert is defined as any conduit that conveys water through an embankment. That is a large conduit, a large culvert you find over there. I had to inspect these when I was doing my first job as a site agent and had to crawl through a lot of them and get very muddy. It's the type of stuff you do in your first year of working. But it's fun times, it's enjoyable. Um, yeah, guys, that is everything about drainage.